Welcome back to the Sermon Notes Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Strother, and with me today is my friend, Brian Ball. This season, we are walking through the entire Bible chronologically across all of our Brentwood Baptist campuses. And this week, we'll continue to walk through the books of uh, Judges and Ruth. And so, Brian, my voice is a little weary today (laughs) uh, after five Easter weekend services um, and lots of great gospel conversations and meeting guests. Uh, And so it's been, been been an incredible weekend across all nine of our campuses, reports coming in just about incredible things that God did and new connections made. And that's one of the things that as we kind of jump in today, I want to remind people of is that Easter is not just a day. That's right. Uh, Christians historically have celebrated Easter as a season. That's right. Leads all the way up to Pentecost. So there's kind of a 40 day celebration, uh, you know, that uh, it makes sense, right? Yeah. Jesus is alive. And so we're not just going to celebrate it one day. Matter of fact, it's the reason that we worship on every Sunday. That's right. It's called the Lord's Day. That's exactly right. And some people don't realize that. And so we want to encourage you, right, to to take up new things in the name of the gospel. That's right. Uh, to, to consider how the Holy Spirit is at work in and through you and around you. Right. Uh, and uh, of course, to continue with the Bible reading plan. Absolutely. Uh, and, and it's going to be interesting this week because we're kind of catching up to where we've been, uh, right. Judges and Ruth. Right. And we'll kind of play catch up because of the Easter holiday. Uh, we adjusted the sermon series to include uh, the, the resurrection message from Luke chapter 24. Uh, but we've got lots of time. And then David narrative. There's more uh, narrative material about David than any other single person in the Bible. That's right. Uh, and so we're going to be in that for a while. So we want to go back and spend some time with Judges and Ruth. And, you know, I thought about this. It's it's ironic or way. It's interesting to juxtapo- uh, juxtapose. I can't talk today. The, the two, um, you know, because, uh, you know, the light and this, the celebration of, of, of Easter, uh, the hope that's there. But now we get to go back to probably the darkest period in Israel's history. Absolutely. Uh, and I think the contrast is actually really compelling. It is. Well, it gives us the reason that we need Christ, yeah. right? It shows us, and we talked a little last week about our sin in black and white, and it's even clearer through Judges, right? With everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. Mm-hmm. That's that's the echoing theme through the book. And and we and we look at Judges kind of how it's back, how it's come together. We don't know who wrote it, right? Perhaps Samuel, Samuel the prophet, but we really don't know. Um, it covers a 350 year period between Joshua's death and the area of of, of uh, Samuel and Saul, and then where uh, in in Joshua God's purpose is to is to take the land, or to go to go as a, as a people and take the land. In Judges, the land takes them. Mm-hmm. Right. All, all of a sudden, we see the problems, and we'll talk about you know not eradicating everyone in there and, and what that means. Uh, the historical narr- it's a historical narrative. Judges contains some of the darkest stories in the Bible, uh, and we see a pattern of God's people: right, disobedience, discipline, despair, and deliverance. And we see that in not only God's people, we see that in our own lives. That's right. As, as how we've come to Christ. And why? It's because God's people self-destruct when they disobey God and embrace the mm-hmm. values of the surrounding culture, doing what's right in their own eyes. And we see this cycle, right? Israel serves the Lord, right? And then Israel falls into sin and idolatry. Israel is enslaved. Israel cries out to the Lord. God raises up a judge, and Israel is delivered. And then it starts again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's so important for us to remember because we fall into these same cycles and patterns in our lives. We do, and and, and we do as a people as well. Right. And so the book of Judges, it's it's helpful to remember that with each of these judges, you see a pattern that repeats itself. But sadly, each time the sin of the people gets more depraved. Yes. Uh, Some of this stuff that you read in this book, this is one, you know, (laughs) PG-13, shading towards rated R in places, especially if you really understand the depths of the Hebrew and what they're talking about. You know, when you talk with your kids and they're like, I can't believe this stuff is in the Bible. Right. Well, that's the the depths of our sin. That's right. When there's no restraint. That's right. You know, then then we we too fall into this downward spiral over and over again. Well, and you see that in the internet, right? When the internet first came around, people were anonymous and free. Yeah. And what did what was the big thing that came up, right? And and, and really until the late 20, 2000 aughts, the number one money making thing on the internet was pornography. Yeah. And you would think now that people are free and unrestricted, it would be charity. 
right, if we, it was a hope. But no, just like judges, right, when we're free of restraint, we see evil take hold. Yeah, we, we fall as quickly and as far down that rabbit hole as we can possibly go that's in our exactly. sin. And so exactly. that's kind of the, mm. the, the writ story of judges. Uh, you know, being a history guy, I, I find it really fascinating that there's two introductions and two conclusions to mm. judges. Uh, chapter one is, is kind of written from a historical military perspective. Right. And so you see uh, another vantage point of, you know, the people, you know, it, throughout the book of Joshua, what they were doing, they were conquering this place, they were conquering that place. But, but all along the way it says but they they failed to run out all of the people right or they took some of the people and they made them indentured servants or slaves and so instead of people being completely obedient to god's word they left remnants of the pagan people the canaanites in the land yes. and that would cause a problem wouldn't it that would because all of a sudden you start to merge the values and you start to follow their gods and that disobedience following those false gods. And you get into, right, chapter, I love the, the you know, chapter one, it was, they, they look like they could not eradicate the people. Yes. And it turns out in chapter two that they would not. Yeah. And that's a whole different thing. Yeah, it's almost a lens into our discipleship, right? That's we great we point. assume that, you know, oh, well, God, I'm going to commit this part of my life to you, but I'm going to hold this part back for right. myself. I'm not going to be completely obedient, in other words. Right. And when you do those remaining things in your life that are not holy, that are not of God, that are not in line with his word and his wisdom, uh, they become like landmines in our spiritual life. That's right. And you never know when they're going to go off. Yeah. That That's the thing. And it, and it goes off, and our sin is not just perfect personal, like you say, it affects the people around us. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so critical about these things. When we're unfaithful in these things, we think, well, this is just me, mm -hmm. and I'll be okay with whatever it is. It will not. Yeah. Right? Your sin will take you. Yeah. And and it will and it will then affect your family. It will then affect your community. It will then affect your witness. Yeah. And all of those things are 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 God given gifts of God that are then that are then you know, corrupted to a degree by our sin because yeah. we're not obedient. Yeah, as the old Puritan pastor John Owen once said in his book, "The Mortification of Sin: Kill sin, or it will kill you." Every time, no exception. Bottom line. Every and time. we see that not only spiritually, but also even physically, of course, in, in, yeah. in the stories here. And, and another interesting point to make as we get into this, you know, you mentioned about these, these idols and these other gods of the Canaanites. What's interesting to me, is, and this is why it's so relevant to today, is the Israelites never said, oh, we're going to stop worshiping Yahweh and we're going to embrace Baal or Ashtra or any of these other things, you know, Dagon. Instead, it's syncretism. Right. They continue to worship Yahweh on the side, right? But over here, but we're going to mix in these other gods. And we see that in the false gospels of today, mm -hmm. right? They're not these completely apostates. As a matter of fact, some of these false gospels are 80 and probably 90% true or so. Yeah. But that 10% is, is what makes them apostate. Yeah. And you have to be so careful reading God's Word. And this is why reading the Bible as we're doing mm -hmm. as a group, right, as a community, is so critical to yep. know His Word and know God's character. And so we can identify identify those things that are not in God's characters yep. in some in in so many and they manifest themselves in very subtle ways because yeah. like security mm -hmm. what God wants me to be comfortable and secure that's not in the book yeah. Right. Well, yeah. He will. He will call you to do hard things. That's right. God will will protect you. He'll provide Absolutely. for His people. Right. But we take it to this this other degree. Right. You know, and we have these demands that we make upon God. Yep. And God says, Fantastic. "Here's the reality. Right. right. You've been disobedient to my word. Right. And that's what He tells the Israelites. So let's sit this in the remember the context of the big story. We're right. in chapter two. We're in scene four. God's people taking the land, as you mentioned, but really the land. They, the people they, of the <laughs> land start taking them uh, back, so to speak, because they 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 fail to to root them out. So. If if we go back to Deuteronomy 6, we, we spend a little bit of time with this. Deuteronomy 6, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yes. Have no other gods before me. That's right. one of the big 10, right? <laughs> so they violate that as we've just discussed. Yeah. But it's also interesting. They say, impress these things upon your children. That's right. And so what the book of Judges is, sadly, is the failure of Deuteronomy 6 yes. in the generation after Joshua. Because it says in chapter 2, as we, we turn to kind of the spiritual dimension, as you yeah. said, it's not just that they, they could not, they, they would not. Right. Why? Because it says that a generation grew up who knew neither the Lord, nor what He had done for Israel, and that is just tragic. And it we, is. and we, and we, we, when we don't impress that on our children, we assume by bringing them to church, mm -hmm. right, that we don't have to live holy lives. Because what I found, at least in my sons, is they will do what I do. 
I can say whatever I want. Mm-hmm. I can take them wherever I want to, wherever I want. And other people can talk to them, mentor them, but they're going to do what I do. They're going to do what Rachel does, right? They're going to do, uh, they're going to imitate us. And if we're not faithfully following, there's no way we can impress that in the, in the permanence. Yeah. That's what I love about, right? When it's the hammer and the chisel yeah. in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy. It's, it's, it's that it's permanence, mm-hmm. right? The permanence of that. Yeah, where it says children. impress these beliefs on your children is that, that word picture of a hammer and chisel. You go over the same truths, the, the, the truth of God over and over until it leaves an impression. Right. But Judges shows us what happens when, when that doesn't take place, right. when it's assumed. Right. And so it says, and this is fascinating, and I think so relevant for this moment for us culturally, you know, in, in, as, as believers in the moment we're in, it says, and so they were unable to resist the cultures around them. Wow. And the reason we have the next generation, you know, coming, coming behind us struggling with cultural issues is because in many cases, they haven't seen authentic discipleship in the lives of their parents and grandparents. That's right. But again, the antidote is to tell the story. That's the right. antidote is to to lead them to the word of God right. uh, and to be obedient to it. But before we get there, we're, we're going to see, right, the, the cycles of the judges. And so as we, we begin to jump in, Right, we we know the cycles begin that that the you know we have guys like Othniel and Ehud and Shamgar and my my favorite one sentence sermon right of Shamgar, uh, this guy who kills six hundred Philistines with an ox goat is you know start with where you are, yep. do what you can and yep. use what you have all off one verse, you know just just from one verse. I call him the world's first ninja. He takes he down really six hundred guys with just a pole basically used for knocking the clod out of the dirt of the oxen, you know. No, but not to make lightly of that, God yeah. used him in that Absolutely. moment. He was faithful. But with each story, again, the depravity gets a little deeper and God's yes. people dig themselves a little bit more yeah. uh, into a hole. So we see Deborah and Barak, which right. is interesting that God uses this woman, a prophetess, right. because there's a void of leadership in Israel during that time. He uses her and then he uses Barak on the military side of things. Right. And, and chase they chase the enemy general in pursuit. And then he ends up right taking refuge where he thinks we would be safe and turns out not to be so safe. Yeah. Right. Not to be graphic in what happened, but the Bible certainly is. Yeah. But he it, gets a tent peg through, through the head. head. And that's, 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 and that's a, we think about the honor shame culture. Yeah. Right. That we've talked about so many times. That's incredibly shameful. One, to not be able to protect yourself. And that's then right. for a woman to kill you with a household item. Yeah. Basically a household appliance. Right. He I was mean, killed with. Take, takes him out. And, mm-hmm. and this great general. But that's often how God works. Yeah. Right. In very unexpected yeah, ways. Yeah. God's people. Or the underdog, right? And so, so again, honor shame culture, and so that general and his army, right? They're shamed in every way, right? And God's people are honored in this surprising victory, right? And are ra- and are raised up, and that kind of brings up violence mm-hmm. in scripture, and and probably something we should exist. That and and first, right, a, a violent world is a natural consequence of our sin nature. Mm-hmm. We see that loosed. Yeah. Right, with Cain and Abel. Yeah, to be every time people. anybody wants to say, well, the Bible's so violent. I was like, well, that that go back to Genesis <laughs> 1 and 2, right. where, where, where all things were existing in harmony together. Right. That is one of the consequences of sin. That's right. And so it's not, uh, to be clear, that God condones violence. As a matter of fact, he's very clear that he's a God of peace, right? That he's he's a God of, of, of order, as we've talked about repeatedly. Yep. So we need to remember that these stories are prescriptive. Right. Not, uh, I'm sorry. Totally got that wrong. It's a Monday morning. It's okay. They're descriptive, descriptive right. right? Let's get that right. Descriptive of what happened, not prescriptive of what should happen. Absolutely. And and it's a different era. It's a different covenant they're under, right? The old and the new covenant. Christ brings a new covenant. And so there were ways that God worked in the Old Testament that's different than how he presents. Yeah, but just like in every same. era of history, right? right? He worked through right. the brokenness, the sin, the violence of the people, right? you know, to, to, to accomplish his plan and purposes, you know, and much the same that he works now through through Christ, you know, uh, to fulfill his plan and purposes That's and exactly. through the working of his spirit in the church. Well, and, and like I say, he did it through these people and these people, this was a taking of the land. So there was an inherent war, right? And, and But Jesus himself faced great violence. Yeah. Having just come out of Holy Week, we need to remember this, that our God was not some distant God just letting people, right, fight it out, that he stepped in right. to our world. 
including taking that violence on himself. I mean, right. Isaiah 53, we'll get there in a couple of months, right? Is one of the most descriptive passages of the, the violence that Jesus took on himself as the suffering servant. Well, it could barely be recognized mm-hmm. because of the violence done to him. And yeah. then, of course, the cross is the, the most horrible way to die. And so we see violence all around him, the beatings, pulling off his beard. But that's the world, and that's what Christ took for mm-hmm. us and yeah. took to the grave for us so that in his resurrection we could be raised too. Yeah. And not that we don't exist in a violent world, but that's not our response to the world. That's right. right. That's our right. Response, we response. don't stoop to that level, right? right? We we look for the good. We look for where God is at work in all of that. Mm-hmm. And you know, you and I have talked about this before. It's pretty fascinating that if you just take a summary look, I don't spend a lot of time watching TV or shows or movies. I just mm-hmm. don't have that kind of time. But but our world has definitely taken a bent towards even superhero movies are now pretty dark yes. and dystopian and all of these kind of things. And I think in a way that's an echo of what we feel is happening to us in a culture. Right. It's getting darker. It's getting more depraved. It's getting scarier all of the time. And so, again, this idea is is the light then shines brighter against that dark, dark backdrop. And so I think, you know, one of the redemptive moments that we have is to point to things like judges. Like the Bible is just as dark (laughs) as any of these television shows, novels, you know, podcasts, crime podcasts, whatever, you know, that's out there when you really lean into it. Again, this this book is full of stuff like, I I can't believe that's in the Bible. Right. Right. It's, It's there. But again, it's too short show when we are left to our own sin, how broken we are, but it's also to show our need for the light. Well, and also to show human beings as we really are. One of my, in apologetics, one of my arguments has always been that one of the reasons I believe Christianity is the Bible, more than anything else, Mm -hmm. describes human beings as we really are. Yeah. And so that shows our need for God so clearly. I think our culture is is despairing because Mm -hmm. the false gods keep falling. Mm Mm-hmm. If you've watched over the last 50 or 60 years, yeah. and I'm sure it's had, I've just been around that long, but I'm, <laughs> I'm sure it's happened before me, but sure. it's it's fascinating to mm-hmm. watch the cultural gods fall. Mm-hmm. And 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 the, each time they fall, it's despairing. Mm-hmm. It's frightening. Mm-hmm. This is what we had our hope in, the stock market, the, yeah. the, the, the Cold War, I mean, yeah. the whole ethos behind yeah. that. Some entertainer Some, or athlete or musician or, or pastor. leader or pastor or, yeah, president, you know, right. and then they fall right. and, and, you know, there's this moment of disillusionment. But again, that, that's, that's showing what the book of Judges shows us. That's exactly that right. When there's a void of spiritual leadership tethered to God's word and obedient to God's word, the people are going to struggle every time and society is going to struggle along with it. That's right. It, it brings about the consequences not just personally, but like you say, culturally and, and in, in our societies. And that's why I think Deuteronomy 20, when you have a king, first mm-hmm. thing he does is write a copy of the law. Yeah, Be, be sure that your king knows the word, mm-hmm. whoever, whoever. And so when you look for authority to follow, yeah. be sure they know the word. Yeah, first and, and foremost. First and foremost. Before, and that's in any realm. Mm-hmm. Be sure they know the word. And th- those are the authorities that we follow. Mm-hmm. Those are the authorities that we submit to. Yeah. And oh, so many good threads sorry, I want to run with here. No, it's so good. <laughs> but uh, but let, let's talk about some of the, a couple of the more familiar figures to us because, yep. again, we, we know these, but but we've said them in context. Right. We've got Gideon. Right. And, and, and it's interesting because when you really read the Gideon story, he's a more complex figure than we, we first remember. He is, and, and it's interesting to watch. When, when we've given our we're kind of given our heroes when we were little mm-hmm. right in, in Sunday school and whatnot and then you read how they really were mm-hmm. you see that it's unmistakable that this was God mm-hmm. and not Gideon yeah. in these things As, and even right, we get the story that where God reduces his army by 99 percent or something Pretty much. something I mean just just gets yeah, it down, just down to a few hundred and and those few hundred may not see don't seem to be the best trained. right contextually yeah if you know how that they they, they selected soldiers he didn't choose the best he basically ended up with the worst right. And, and so the only way this works is God shows up. Mm-hmm. And there are so many places in our lives, I believe the Lord says, I'm putting you here. Mm-hmm. And the only way this works is when I show up. Yeah. And it's beautiful to see the faithfulness of yeah. God. Yeah, once again... Gideon isn't the hero of the story. And it's pretty clear. Right. This guy is, he's threshing grain in a wine press, which is not where you thresh grain, meaning he's hiding. Right. Uh, The angel shows up and calls him mighty man of valor. Like (laughs) it's almost, it's really kind of comical. It is. Because he's not living like a mighty man of valor. But again, he's going to be a man of valor, not because of him. Right. But because of what God wants to do through him. That's exactly right. And so leads, right, Israel to the successful campaign. But then we see the aftermath Mm -hmm. where he wants to be king. You see that there's this drive. 
eye for power. The power goes to his head. It does. And and so we see the faithlessness of him come out. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what makes him such a complex character yeah. in that you can kind of like us. That's right. That we can see the good he does. And then you can see where he's not quite there yet. Yeah. Not yeah. I always find it kind of interesting when, you know, children's Bibles or shows have to pick a hero <laughs> from, you know, this part of the Bible. Well, let's go with Gideon. Gideon. And it's like, well, yeah, in some ways, <laughs> right. you know, God used him in a powerful way, but in other ways, you know, again, power went to his head. Um, you know, it was clearly more about God than it was about Gideon this right. entire time. Samson is another very <laughs> curious figure, uh, very complex. One of the whole themes of the book of Judges is this light and dark. Right. And so his name, Samson, Shimshon in Hebrew means sunny boy. <laughs> And so he was supposed to be an agent of light, right? And just like just like the Messiah himself, his right. his, his birth is is predicted by an angel, uh, right? He's a Nazirite, which yeah. means he is not a Nazirite, right? But a Nazirite, right. which means he's set apart from birth uh, in a unique way to serve God's people. Of course, God gives him supernatural strength, yep. and yet we see his eyes going towards Philistine women. We see his eyes pulled towards the cultures around him, yes. you know, and he begins to rely on his physical strength instead of the strength of the Lord. That's right. And we see his disobedience to his parents. We, we watch these failings and it's, it's fascinating that when they capture him and tie him up, they blind him. Yes. Right. And so sunny boy now fades to darkness. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because I've been there where you have to, to push the wheel around the grain. And the reason why they would blind their prisoners is because you had to go in a circle all day long. And so you wouldn't get dizzy if you were blind. Wow. And so, of course, Samson, a man of great strength, that dude could crush a lot of kernels of grain. I'm sure he could. And so they put his eyes out. But like you said, so for a practical purpose, but for a symbolic and spiritual one as well. That's right. Because he refused to, to use his eyes to fix them on what was good. Right. right. He was blinded. And then, you know, of course, he he is now in the darkness. And, and sadly, this great character of God, like the only thing that he can do at the end of his life is to shove down the columns, you know, allow the temple to collapse. And he goes down with them. Right. It's, and just such a tragic story. It is. It's tragedy. That, that, and and he's all again often brought up as a hero. And and you look at his life, and there's little heroic about it, mm-hmm. other than God's calling on him that he continually and continually and consistently disobeys. Yeah. Right. All through all through the book. And things from there, man, just go south <laughs> yes. uh, in a, in a big hurry because you have this picture in Judges of this guy is set up to be the one, right? right. Who's going to deliver Israel? Right. Well, now, man, it's just the downward spiral on steroids. And there are theologians that say, well, this this points to Israel's need for David the king. Yeah. And I would push... Well, yeah, it's an and, interesting Old Testament perspective. Right. It's, it's an apologetic right. of why Israel needed a king, a strong monarchy. Right. But that's not what it points to. It's something it, even it, bigger. It points to something even bigger, mm-hmm. Jesus our king. And and that's the king that we're at, a, a, a just king, yeah. a king that understands who we are, has been through with us, and still guides and leads us. Yeah, yeah. Don't let it be lost on you. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Right. So everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And we see that so often. You, you, you can do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. You That's, be you. You be you. That's just another way of saying do what is right in your own eyes. And yeah. this just continues to echo and echo and echo. Yeah, we hosted an apologetics conference here uh, back in the fall. And one of the speakers, Natasha Crane was her name. And she said, really, if you want to get to the root of it, what everybody is about is the authority of self. That's right. That is the God of our age. Right. The ultimate authority of self. Right. To be who I want to be, dress like I want to dress, act like I want to, you know, take on whatever identity I want to take on. Mm-hmm. And that that's what it is. Everybody doing what was right in their own eyes. And you see in Judges, again, if we would just look back, how culture totally collapses in. Right. You know, we talk about culture eating itself. Right. Because at some point, none of these things, if everyone is doing what they think is right, there's no common good. There's no common grace. There's no common objective standard of truth or goodness or morality to hold things together. And that's why in the New Testament it says Jesus. Jesus Christ holds all things together. That's right. Well, the only the only ethos between people is power, mm-hmm. right? Do you that's do right. you get do you get to consume and enjoy, or do I get to consume and enjoy? Yeah. And that's the only question. And that's what we watch judges as mm-hmm. this play out of power, mm-hmm. and that's why people crave it. Yeah. That's why people covet it because that is the currency of the age. Yeah. And Jesus says, no, there's a different way. There's yeah. a different currency. It that, does point to our need. It does. And and it points to that need that, that can only, that that's the only thing that can satisfy. Mm-hmm. And so I love this, right? There's a couple of, of, of kind of gospel statements we see, right? God relent- 
relentlessly offers his grace to people who do not deserve it, seek it, or even appreciate it after yeah. they've been saved by it. Yeah. That, luckily, that doesn't sound familiar. All right. But that, that's all yeah, of us. It is. Us. That's all of us as, as we see God's grace and, God, and God's pursuit of us. Yeah. Right? And that God kept answering. The people right. kept falling into the same pattern of sin. And eventually, they would be so bad, they would cry out. Right. Yeah, and, and, and God would answer. Right. Which is gracious. He didn't have to. At any point in this, he could have said, nope, this is the road you've chosen. Have it your way. Right. And, and you, you lay in your destruction. Mm-hmm. But he didn't. He continues to restore. He continues to yeah. rebuild. Same thing he does with our lives, right? When we get a new heart, mm-hmm. right? when, we get, when we become a new creation, yeah. he restores and rebuilds. Yeah. And, and of course, what God is, is offering the people is a different way, is a different path. Right. A better way, a more flourishing, a more holistic, a better way of life. And he's saying, if you will give me lordship, of your whole lives, not right. just some, right? Right. Then, then you will live in a way that's congruent with how I created you to be, with the purpose that I, I purposed you for and planned you for, you know. And so, what a, what an opportunity we have is to repent at any moment, right? And turn back to the Lord, right? And that's even even post salvation, we we evaluate. I repent. I repent every day. It's part of my daily disciplines is to repent, uh-huh. to look over my life and what what have I disobeyed? Mm-hmm. What have I omitted? There are, right, there are times mm-hmm. where I should have done the good thing and did not. Yeah. And so understanding those things so that I can follow God more yeah. faithfully. Yeah, and to Christ that point, there is this need for continual spiritual renewal in our lives. That's right. We do walk in a broken world. That's right. And, and all of us at some point are going to get caught up in these the, these cycles, the, the vortex of sin and brokenness and darkness that's around us. But the thing we remember is that God is in charge. That's right. right? No, ma- no matter what, God God is over these things. Yeah. And because he is, we right, we can trust him. Yeah. We, and he, hold, he holds. Like, yeah, God is sovereign and so into the middle of this darkest of dark comes one of the most beautiful stories in all of scripture really i i think in the history of the world i agree the, well, the book I, of ruth and i think it's fascinating and this is what's kind of hit me we you, know, you and i are kind of verse people word yeah. people right we dig kind of grind so forcing us up to this fifty thousand mm-hmm. days is pretty uncomfortable yeah. but you see things you don't get to see otherwise and what kind of hit me this time was coming out of judges the darkest period we see these stories of two women mm-hmm Right, a foreign woman, a Moabite Ruth, yep. that leads to the king, and this barren woman, right, cursed by God. Barrenness was cursed by God. This barren woman, Hannah, that leads to the prophet Samuel. Mm-hmm. And it's beautiful that those are the stories of hope that come out of Judges. Yeah. And that's just, I think that's just magnificent. It that is. The Lord would work that way. Again, so unexpected ways that were really against the cultural norms of the time. Yeah. But just yeah. stunning. There's, just the old, there's the old poetic saying, it's always darkest just before the, the dawn. dawn. Yeah. And so you have this dark, dark, right? It's dark time. And all this. And even the story of Ruth starts, you know, with death, right. uh, with difficulty. Uh, Naomi, you know, and her husband, they flee to, to, to Moab to, to try to survive, um, but in doing so, they're leaving, right, the protection of, of Israel, of their homeland, um, and so through it all, she gains, Naomi gains this uh, daughter-in-law named Ruth, who's a Moabitess. She's right. not an Israelite. She's an outsider. Right, and 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 but that, and it's interesting, her sons take two Moabite women, right? but yeah. his wives, again, going back in there, one leaves, right, Orpah, mm-hmm. and then one stays. Ruth stays faithful and comes back to Israel. I think it's also interesting, so in the, in the chapter one, it ends, mm-hmm. right, it was the barley harvest, yeah, which is the first harvest of the year. So that's yeah. giving a hint that hope yeah. is here. Yeah, there's this turn at the end, and really, of course, that, that the chapter one pivots on on Ruth's faith in yeah. the sense of you know there's something about Yahweh, even though the family that she's been married into clearly is not following all of the the law and they're not doing all everything right. There's still something so compelling about Yahweh right. that she says, wherever you go, I go. Right. Your people are going to be my people and your God will be my God. Right. What what a courageous declaration of faith. Yeah. What a scary moment for her to right. realize my husband's dead. All I've got is this bitter that's what <laughs> right. Naomi Mara, starts right. calling herself, Mara, right? Yeah. Bitter, bitter mother in law. I mean that would be pretty difficult for any of us. And they show back up in Bethlehem and it's oh what happened to them, you know, uh, who and who's this foreign lady and all of that. But you're right. There's this note of hope that there's a harvest to come, which is symbolic of what happens in, in chapter two. That's exactly right. And the other thing I found interesting going into chapter two was when she was in the field, she had to follow these men carefully so she wouldn't be attacked. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. This it's is a violent in time. This is yes. in Israel. Yeah. But but obviously the backdrop there is is abuse against women. That's exactly right. But that was a common thing in that time. That was a, a mark of the depravity when the defenseless, right, women, children, right, when they, they have to be protected because they will be attacked right. in public, then you know it's a dark time. That's exactly right. But she goes to gather in a field. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And here's what I love. Again, Bible reading. Remember <laughs> way back in Leviticus, all that stuff, all those laws. It talked about leaving grain at the yep. edge of your fields. Yep. And so so you have a man, Boaz, who is a farmer and is being faithful to obey the law to provide for widows and orphans and foreigners and outsiders who didn't have access to income, you know, so that they could have some bread to eat. So again, start connecting the exactly. points of the story, which is so fun to me. And Brian, you've heard me preach this before. I, again, one of the, the God moments for me was realizing it says that, you know, uh, Naomi's bitter, uh, but, but, you know, Ruth decided to get up. And, and gather grain to make some bread. Right. What a great faith lesson for us. Right. Even when you don't know what to do, you do the next right thing. That's exactly you right. You get up in the morning and you go to work. Right. You get up in the morning and you parent your children. That's right. You get up in the morning and it says, and she happened to step in the field belonging to Boaz. And so you look that up in Hebrew and not to go into the, all the etymology of the word, but it's basically, it's huge. Hint, hint, wink, wink. This wasn't mere coincidence. That's right. This was divine appointment. That's right. And so you never know on any given ordinary common day, and even if your circumstances are dire, Mm. like Ruth's were, you get up, you do the next right thing, knowing that God is already ahead of you in the story. And of all of the fields around Bethlehem, I've been there. I've walked around (laughs) Bethlehem and thought, man, out of all the places she could have walked, north, east, west, south, the spirit directed her into the field of a man who would protect her. Yep who was already providing for, for widows and, yes. and, and those who were needy. Yep. And of course, who had the character and the, the lineage and the connection to become her kinsman redeemer. Right, and and that's so critical to the story that because you redeem your your, your, your relative mm-hmm. in, in way in through Israel and its practices. And so there was a redeemer closer to her though. Yeah, right? that a he, family he, member that was closer that right. could have brought her into that family. Right, and he would get the land, right? And, and these things that were endowed with her. And so he, Right, they go to the city gates, which is where the business was done, yeah. and go through. Do you do you want to redeem this? He says, "Sure." Well, there's this widow and Moabite woman that go, "Not so much." Right? <laughs> like, I don't. I don't yeah. want my inheritance. And you think about that. I don't want my yeah. inheritance. There's a response added responsibility. More right. mouths to feed. Exactly. And so he he relinquishes that right. But Boaz go, was ethical. That's right. He approached it in the right way. He went to the city leaders. He worked through the process. They swapped sandals, right. which is kind of a funny way of shaking hands. That's right. But uh, but that's what they did. And so you see the character of Boaz. Right. And what happens? God rewards them with a child after they're married. That's right. And then you get this incredible little, you know, epilogue to the book there at the very end. Right. That Ruth becomes the the mother of Jesse. Jesse, of course, will give birth to David. Yes. David on down the line, right? Of course, from the Davidic line comes Jesus, the Messiah himself. Right. And so, as you pointed out earlier, Brian, how beautiful. And man, it just <laughs> makes my heart beat fast that God, during a dark time, plucked a Moabitess woman, right, out of obscurity yep. and wove her into the family tree of the Messiah himself. That is unbelievable. And it's the return of the Toldots, right, from Genesis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we see that explained in the generations mm-hmm. of, and that's just unbelievable that that's where this story would come, out of the darkness. Yeah. Right, come, come, comes the king, the lineage of the king. Yeah, and comes the hope. Of Jesus, right. And as we described on Easter, hope is not wishful thinking in right. biblical terms. That's right. Hope is certain because it's based on the promises of God. And ultimately, we'll see in the new covenant, hope is a person. That's right. In Jesus, who That's came right. to keep every one of the promises of God so that they are yes and amen. That's right. Well, I've always loved to teach that one day we're going to give hope a hug. Yeah. Right. We're going to give hope a hug. And I think that's a staggering thing when you think about the way the world thinks about hope. Mm-hmm. And we have a personification. Yeah. So let's go back to our takeaways. Yeah, yeah. Well, man, we could go on <laughs> forever. I cover a lot of ground today, but uh, let, let's do it. What, yeah. what do we learn about God from this story? God is faithful, right? Even through our darkness and disobedience. Yeah. He, is, he always provides hope especially in unexpected ways Mm -hmm. where we see him time and time again, as we've said, as the, as the people wander away. Yeah. And remember he's sovereign in the middle of all of this. He is Like as dark as it gets, you're like, where is God in these stories? But again, we zoom out and we can see his hand. We can trace his hand at work. And when we'll turn to him, he's always there. That's right. He's always there. That's right. And so man, right. We're we're idle. Yeah. What do we learn about ourselves? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) John, John Calvin, famous theologian. All right. Said in his institutes, the human heart is an idle factory. 
Man, it really is. You leave anything around us for us to turn to other than God himself, and we're going to turn to it at some point, and we're going to try to find life when that idol, that thing, that someone other than God can only take life. It right. cannot give life. And we know that. We the, do. The ironic and part yet is we, we, do, know it that we, we anyway. do it anyway. That's just, and, and, and for God to be that patient. Right. Walking with us, walking yeah. in that through us, and again, always being there for us to turn to. Mm-hmm. If you will repent, right? If you will repent, right. and so that's why, in addition to studying scripture and praying daily, that the repentance is a big mm-hmm. part of our yeah. walk. Yeah, well, and, and to go New Testament for a second, you know, when we say, why, why does God wait if the world is so dark? Right. Why doesn't He send Jesus to make it all right now? Well, the same reason in Judges, right? Right, that he had a plan that he was bringing to fruition, and then it says in Second Peter, he is not slow, right. as we think of slowness. Instead, he delays, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance yes. and a knowledge of the truth. Amen. And 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 thank goodness he did that for me. That's right. Thank goodness he did that for you. Yeah. Anytime we get on our high horse and we're like, God, come smite them all now. <laughs> right. Remember that God could have done that before you and I came to Christ. That's exactly right. And and we deserve it. Right. We we were yeah. deserving of it, and, and but but Jesus, right? And so that's where we see Jesus. He's the ultimate righteous judge. That's right. Right. First Timothy four one talks about him being right the judge of all, and and we need someone to save us from ourselves. Yeah. And I I think that's what we miss so many times mm-hmm. is is we think we I need salvation from mm-hmm. whatever this cultural element is or whatever this thing is, and yeah. most we we need to be saved from ourselves yeah. from what what we will put. Yeah. What rescues us in a time when everyone does what is right in their own eyes is a true savior, a Messiah. And if we fix our eyes on him, the author of Hebrews says, the author and perfecter of our faith, then our eyes are fixed in the right place. Yeah, that's just beautiful. And so what do we do? Right, we know God's word and obey it. I realize, and I realize that's kind of the Sunday school yeah. answer, but that that's what we need, right? It's true, right? When we're, why we're reading through the Bible as a congregation, right? To know Him and His character, to love God more, so that we can obey Him more fully through the strength of the Spirit. Yeah, well, to connect it back to last week, when God told Joshua, above all, right, be strong and very courageous to not let this book of the law depart from you. That's right. And when a generation came after the Joshua generation that didn't even teach their kids the book of the law, right? What happened was total brokenness in their culture, total depravity and sin. And so, again, like you said, it it, it seems, you know, it's not a superficial answer at all to say the key for God's people is always obedience to his word, trust and obey. Right. For there's no other way. way. That's it. At it's the like end somebody of the wrote day. a song about it. I think so. That. But we won't sing it. No, we'll spare, we, we will we'll spare, spare the audience and we'll wrap this thing up. So. Absolutely. Yeah, well, well, that's it for today's episode of the Sermon Notes podcast. We hope you found our discussion helpful. And if you did, help us out by leaving a review in your podcast app or even dropping a comment in the YouTube comments below. If you have questions about anything you've read, leave those in the comments and we'll try to get to those next week. As always, we thank you for listening, watching, and we will see you next week.